Do you have to go to church to be a Christian? We're going to talk about that today on Life Questions. I am not Bill Harris. I'm sitting in for Bill today. My name is Jeff Millslegel, and I have four area pastors are going to be here. Help us talk about that topic and a handful of other things. We're going to start to my immediate right here with Pastor Rick Shear. And uh, Pastor, you are over there at the Living Hope Assembly of God in St. Mary's. Good to have you here. Next, uh, Pastor Chris Langstaff with Bell Center Church of Christ. Over here to my left, we would have uh, Jeff Kimberly of uh, Neapolis uh, Church of Christ. And finally, Pastor Randy Davis of the Bridge Church right here in Lima. Okay, gentlemen, so this is the question that was written to us. And uh, it, how important is corporate worship for the believer? And I hear this question a lot, kind of what I teased out there about, do you have to go to church to be a Christian? How important is corporate worship? Why would you not want to? <laughs> Yeah. Why, why, as a Christian, why, why would you not want to go be with other believers? Um, the the go-to passage, I think, for that is for the Hebrews 10. Uh, Do not forsake meeting together as some yeah. are in the habit of doing. Let me read that quick. I want to make sure we all grasp this. I'm actually going to start in verse 24. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, so that much more as you see the day approaching. In, in this uh, last, what, two, two years-ish, uh, all that stuff going on, uh, ha have you seen this worked out? In your churches here, I'm not going to come to church. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah I'll totally. watch online. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I think I think one of the biggest things that, and I don't know that we want to necessarily talk about the pandemic, but I think every generation has had something that has created fear or discontent or worry or something. This just happens to be one for our generation. But I think what happens is, at least in the last two years, in my experience, is people have gotten out of the habit. <laughs> ah. And because what happens is when we get in the habit, the, the whole idea that the different definition of fun, the different definition uh, going on there, and we've gotten out of the habit of going to church and fellowshipping with one another. It's easy to sit and watch church in our pajamas on our couch. Let's be honest, it is. Um, when we were closed as a church, I pre-recorded. I enjoyed sitting there on Sunday morning mm. watching. And, uh, but it, it's a habit that we, we've got to break because we've got to get back in the habit of fellowshipping with one another. Iron sharpening iron rather than TV right. feeding us. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, I read on, I think it was on Facebook, the statistic that if, if we don't make church a priority, the next generation, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a snowball effect, and sure. pretty soon you're three or four generations back and they go, who's God? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you start off with, okay, church is a priority, we're there. I mean, when I was growing up, right. if the doors were open, we were at church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, today it's, well, if the doors are open, I'll be there once a month. And, and then, you know, in another generation, you know, when those kids grow up, it may be, well, if the doors are open, I'll be there once every six months. You know, and that, so we're, mm -hmm. we're creating a, I hate to say it this way, but we're creating a generation of Christmas and Easter kids. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. who only come on Christmas and Easter. They get their fill of Jesus for the year and they go, I'm done. I would Thank go a you. step farther. We're creating a generation of Easter and Christmas viewers online. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah. Well, it, it's hard to miss a Sunday, but it gets easier. Oh, every mm -hmm. Sunday oh, that you do yes. it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. It, it gets easier. And, and I, think, I, I think we need to be careful. Okay. Obviously, the church is more than just the building. Absolutely. That's not what we're talking about. The, mm -hmm. the question is, should, as a believer, should we find an importance in meeting together with other Christians? How are you going to live your life the other six days a week if you don't spend at least an hour, maybe two, if you're really holy, go to Sunday school. <laughs> how, how are you going? How are you going to live your life without the support that you get from other believers? And, and the Hebrews passage that you read, I, I honestly I think the most important word in that is is the encourage is the encourage mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. We we laugh together, we cry together. We when when one part of the body is and Paul writes this when when one part suffers. The whole 
body yeah, suffers yeah. and and we we're not meant to go through life as lone rangers right. we're supposed to go and stanley grenz wrote a book created for community one of my favorite books we're created to be around other christians i mean this goes back to the very beginning after after god created the earth he saw that that adam was alone and that wasn't good so he completed the creation by by bringing on Eve, by bringing uh, somebody else, so that that Adam could have community mm -hmm. with another human right. being. How dare we think that we can get through this life without experiencing that encouragement mm -hmm. that we get from other believers? Yeah, the Lord mm -hmm. has created us to be social beings, right. so I think right. obviously yeah. being part of a church body is really important to that, right, but Pastor? I think, I think the challenge, Jeff, is the question is how important is it? It's as only as important as you make it. Yeah. That's the problem. I mean, you know, that is it's, it's life and death. I mean, it's, it's, it's energy, it's mm -hmm. oxygen for the believer. But if it ain't important to you, then it's not going to be important to anybody around you. Mm -hmm. right. Here's the challenge. When I was a youth pastor for years, you know, parents would not encourage their kids to come to youth group until they got in trouble, Yep, made bad choices. Ah. And then all of a sudden it was like, well, you got to get them to come to youth group. <laughs> Excuse me, that's kind of your yeah, job. Them, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. I, I, get, I get them an hour and 15 yeah. minutes. You got them the rest of the week. It's kind of your problem. But, yeah. but, but it's the same thing with church. But if you go back to that scripture that you just used in Hebrews 10, different translation, it says, let us consider how we may spur one another on mm. toward love and good deeds. And we have horses and I have spurs and they work. And, ah, uh, ah. and I think believers, the challenge with church today and why it's not important is because it's consumerism. Mm -hmm. Okay. We don't go and say, what can I do today at church to be involved? What can I do to spur someone on? How can I look around the building and see somebody discouraged and go and say, hey, brother, can I pray for you? We, we come and consume. What is church going to give me today? What am I going to get out of church? There's no serving. There's no participation. Uh, they don't even participate sometimes in the offering. They don't really sing. They watch the show. Yes. And, and because, we are guilty sometimes because we created made, it. Because yes. I hate to yes. say it this way, yep. but there are churches who have bought into the consumerism of church and made it a show. Sure. So, yes. so you go to church where, you know, when I was growing up, you went to church to learn, right. to grow, to, to serve. But now we go to church to be entertained. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I didn't get anything out of the sermon today. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, I, I'm sorry, but I hope yeah. you come back next week. Uh, yeah. But maybe the person sitting three people down from you uh, yeah. was was ripped to shreds and, and is confronting their right. sin now. Well, uh, I had it's that not Sunday. about us. You know, like Rick Warren, the, the book that he wrote, The, the Purpose Driven Life, it's not about you. Yeah. I mean, and, and when you, when a, a church is full of people, like, like you were saying, Jeff, that, that consume, they don't ever give anything back, right. that, that church isn't going to be a church no. very long. I had that yeah. happen Sunday when you're talking about why well, I didn't get anything out of the sermon. I'm standing at the back door and this couple comes and they go, that was a horrible sermon. We got absolutely nothing out of it. And I'm thinking to myself, gee, thanks. <laughs> wow. and, and then this lady <laughs> to behind them hears the conversation and goes, that was the best sermon I've ever heard. It really, it really spoke to me. Yeah. How dare you tell him that his work doesn't matter? <laughs> so and so they got on this like almost, you know, this and, and I'm like, guys, it touch it may touch her in a way different way than it, it hit you, and that's okay. So th this is uh, so we're all agreeing here, and you guys are all on the same page right. about uh, uh, corporate worship is important it for is us important. as is. as a believer. Okay, so let's throw this around. Do you have to go to church to be a Christian? No, no, no. Ah. But if you are a Christian, you should want to go to church because that's where you find strength, hope, spurring others on, opportunity to help, opportunity to serve. The, the challenge with being a Christian, if, if you're not actively walking with Christ in Christ-like ways and doing His work, you're going to get bored with it really quick because it won't work. It's, it's, it's not ah, fun. Okay, so say that again because that's really good. You've got to be active. you you got to be, if, if you're just... Mm -hmm doing church and going to but, church but and checking the box. being active is a lot different than what you were talking about, just being entertained. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I use this really kind of funny joke, and I use it a lot, and it's, it's a funny little story, but it's got a great principle. Uh, two parents were going home from church a couple years ago, and they were having what I call Pastor Hash, and they were basically, you know, saying, <laughs> I didn't get anything out of it. It was a bad sermon, blah, blah, blah. Finally, the, you know, eight-year-old daughter pipes up in the back seat and says, well, what did you expect for two bucks? Mm. <laughs> Yeah. You get yeah. what you so put now into some it. Some of you are so, going to take a little bit to yeah. catch that. Yeah. But yes, yeah. But yeah. Okay. There's, a, there's a principle there that if you're not putting anything into it, 
you're not going to get near as much out. Mm-hmm. And one thing about men, men don't want to have a prayer breakfast anymore. Men want to do an activity. What can we do for yep. God? Give me a chance to use my hands, my feet, my mouth to do something for God. So it, it's active participation. It, it's not just, again, corporate worship and, and being a follower of Christ and being the church. I think there's some definition things we need to talk about because you said it earlier, we are the church. And so where we go, we take him with us. And if people could realize you're the church when you're at work being the best employee you could be, mm. that is an act of worship unto God because you are there to serve, to be that person. Mm-hmm. That's all a part of our Christianity. It's not corporate worship where you get fed in and, 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 and that sense, but it's you being the church where you are. And, and I say it starts at home. It starts with me being the best husband I can be. Then the best father, now the best grandfather, which is the best and easiest job I've the ever had. The grandparent gig's a good so one, isn't that's, it? Yeah. That's the best. Yeah. But, you know, you just, you got to figure out for yourself, how important is it? You give me your checkbook and your calendar, and I'll tell you what's important to you. Mm. Mm. You know, going to the lake's a great thing. I love it. I love all my church people that have lake houses and boats, and I use them all. But I don't want to live my life there every summer mm. and skip God. Yeah. Because your kids will skip God, and they'll skip him in the spring, the summer, the winter, the fall. Mm. And, and, and they won't come back. Mm. And then you'll be mad because you did something wrong. I'm just trying to ease you of guilt later. Keep the church a priority, no matter the season, no matter what's going on, no matter the pandemic, yep. and God will take care of you. Mm-hmm. you I know, just believe it. You know, you, you said make church a priority. And in, when I was in youth ministry, I saw, the, I saw the opposite of, well, they're in trouble, get them into church. I saw it as, oh, you got in trouble, go to church. I'm going to use church as a punishment. punishment. Yep. So you have to go yeah. to church. Grounded. Yeah. And then you're grounded, and here's your gr- you've got to go to church. And these kids would come, and they'd be like, I don't want to be here. Like, it's they, like being sensible of principles office, yeah. right? And then like, I would know that. And you're, yeah. and you're trying to, like, make it, you know, you're trying to teach the kids that come every week with these kids that don't want to be there. And then, oh, they're done being grounded, and you never see them again. Yeah. yeah. It's like, well, I, I met the requirement, right. you know. Well, it, you're not going to get a... You're not going to get a check mark next to your name for every Sunday that you attend church because, oh, God takes, doesn't take attendance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You should want to be there, Absolutely. not mm-hmm. because you have to be there. And, and, and it's, it's that culture shift that we have to make in our, in our minds. And as frustrating as the lack of desire to uh, have corporate worship within one's heart, it's frustrating. I mean, we all, we all know yeah. that. It's frustrating. We also have to, as leaders, be careful that we haven't pigeonholed corporate worship mm-hmm. you know do you get, me again explain that a bit what do you mean you, you, no you don't get as much online but there are legitimate reasons to be at home sometimes right so it, and and if that's the best you can get that's the best you can get Oh, okay sure mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are legitimate reasons for the that and then and then the other end of that is in our little community of st. Mary's Ohio there's something like they say like 32 percent of the people cannot attend church for reasons, work, whatever mm. reasons. And so if we make corporate worship Sunday morning at 10 a.m. only, yeah. then we've missed it as the leaders mm. right. of making corporate right. worship important for people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so we've got, so there's, there is two sides to that, but yeah. corporate worship is vital in the growth of one's heart. I totally agree with you gentlemen on that. All right, so we're going to take a brief break and when we come back we're going to tackle another one of life questions. We'll be right back. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now, back to the discussion. Well, I wish you could have tuned in to our conversation in the break here. All sorts of great, great things talking about <laughs> corporate worship and that sort of thing. All right, I'm going to shift gears here a little bit. We're going to talk about a, a, a subject that comes up often here on Life Questions, and uh, we just want to tackle this again. So it's real simple. Simple words, but it's a big question. And that is, why does God allow children to suffer? I'm going to expand that a bit and say, why does God allow suffering? What, why does God allow, in this case, children, to suffer. How do we answer this? How do we respond to this? 
One of, one of the challenges is, is suffering is a part of life. It's part of the fall. It's just a part of the cycle of life. We don't like it when children suffer, especially when you're talking about kids, young people. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's the hardest thing for, I think, anybody to deal with. Um, I don't believe in the, the, the sins of the Father. Is, 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 I believe it's broken when you become Christ or a Christian. But uh, unfortunately, some of what happens to children is a direct, direct result of, of how their parents do life. Mm. Not true in every case, and I'm not trying to make people feel bad. But sometimes our kids are reaping what we've sowed. Uh, because of the, mm. of the lifestyle or, or whatever we've done, and, and they get in trouble, get in over their heads, they can't handle it. And, but at the same time, God can break that. It's not a curse. It's not something that has to be happening. And so I don't believe in the uh, generational curse thing that a lot of people do when you're in Christ. But I also believe that if my family sows enough bad seeds and we don't change our ways, mm. some bad things will be sown into our kids that mm. will cause them suffering. Uh, so I, I think... These people are probably thinking, why do kids get cancer or why do they, you know, some other things. But some of the greatest suffering is not that for the kid. The greatest suffering is feeling alone. Mm -hmm. Parents don't love them. Mm -hmm. Parents aren't there for them. Parents don't take care of them. They're, they're, they're an afterthought. Mm -hmm. so, so how do we address this whole suffering thing? Because that's, I mean, that's, we, we all have to deal with this at one level or Absolutely. another. I'm sure we went, took time, went around the table. We all have personal stories of mm -hmm. suffering. How, how do we address that with people when they come to us and say, you know, Pastor, how come this has happened to me? We're conditioned to look at suffering negatively. Right. Um, because it's no fun. Right. However, those of us that have a few years on us can look back in our lives when things were the toughest when we were legitimately suffering. And honestly, if we do a hard evaluation, I'm gonna guess that that's when we grew the most. Mm. Um, growth is not easy. Growth is, can be painful sometimes. But in those times where we suffer, God is trying to teach us something. And, and the question that the, the person asked, why does God allow yeah. Th that, that shows a level of spiritual understanding that I think a lot of people don't have because a lot of times what people say is, well, why did God do this to me? Ah, yes. Or why did God do this? Or why did mm. God do that? But, but this, the question is phrased, I think, correctly. God allows things to happen in our lives for, for two reasons. One is always for His glory. God doesn't allow anything to happen or doesn't cause things to happen that won't bring him glory. And the second is the way we read Romans 8, all things work together for the good of those who love him. And part of that all things is including times of suffering. Mm. So, so that's why these things happen in our lives. And like we said, maybe it was the, the previous show, our faith is really easy when our lives are going well. They're easy doesn't necessarily equate strong. And, and when we look at the times of suffering, when things are, are difficult, when the only thing we have to cling to is Jesus, that's when the growth happens. Mm -hmm. And just because things are going good doesn't mean there's, there's not suffering going on too. That's true. Right. Yes, right. yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, we also got to think and remember, too, that I, again, I like the way the question is worded. Mm -hmm. uh, why is God allowing it? Well, God is allowing it because we have free will. Mm -hmm. God has designed us that way. God has allowed that to take place. That was from the beginning. That's why Adam and Eve had the first sin was was free will, the allowing thereof. And if we if there wasn't free will, what would we be missing out in freedom in Christ? Yeah. yeah. You know, this whole thing of suffering, you know, I, I we, we live in a fallen world, right? Yep, absolutely. I mean, yep. and so you don't want to give the uh, pat answer of a sin in the world, except that is kind of the truth. It, I, I, I mean, that's right. why we have so right. much of this, right? Yeah. right. Yeah. Well, in James chapter uh, 1, verse uh, 2, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. And mm. I know it, yep. it's one of the scriptures I want to Velcro yeah. right out of my Bible. <laughs> you just want to cross that it's one like out. Really yeah. God, I mean, suffering and, and that, but he goes on to talk about how it creates endurance. And, and when our faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Mm. You can't grow living always in a uh, greenhouse. You got to get outside of that. And so part of life is just challenges and, and tests. 
and I tell this story a lot, but I worked with a guy at Tom Alls that lost his adult daughter that had always had uh, serious uh, retardation and, mm. and uh, had never spoken. And she, I think she was 27 or 28 when she died. And he said, all I could think about when I was walking out of that hospital is I'm looking at all those other rooms, whereas how it could be so much worse. Mm. And I thought, you know, there's a dad with that allowance, that understanding of God and suffering. You know, it had not been easy for them taking care of this daughter for 27, 28 years. But he walked out his faith to the point that even as, as she died, she, as mm -hmm. he said, she went to heaven. Our troubles were over. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But how could you think that in that loss, in that moment? But he right. did. That's what God showed him. And he's walking down the hallway and he said, all I can think about it could be so much worse. Mm -hmm. And man, that's given me strength for my journey that, you know, sometimes we just need to look around mm -hmm. and see there's a lot greater need and suffering than I'm going through. Mm -hmm. My suffering pales in comparison to what so many of the people I've I pastor yeah. go mm -hmm. through. So who am I to complain and not just, you know, suck it up and, and trust God and walk through it and, 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 and grow. And hopefully. yet it, it really is hard things that people are going through. So how do you encourage someone that's going through a time of suffering and maybe a physical thing with themselves yeah. or a loved one or a financial loss or whatever? How, how do you encourage someone that's going through that? Pastor Jeff? Uh, you know, everybody, everybody has seasons of hardship. But the, but the benefits of going through that far outweigh the season that you're going through right now. Mm. Mm -hmm. The benefits of coming through that season are far better than what you're going through right now. I mean, when, I mean, before we came to Neapolis two years ago, we were out of the ministry for two years. Mm. And I can remember sitting in, and we lived with my in-laws, and I remember sitting in the living room at my in-laws and going, why, God, did you allow this to happen? Like, why, why don't I have a church? Like, what did I do wrong hmm. for me not to have a church right now? And my mentor in the ministry who's gone on to Jesus, he said this to me. He goes, there's a lesson in this. And when you see the lesson, that's the point that God will bless you. Hmm. And about the time I saw the lesson was about the time that the phone rang and it was mm. Neapolis going, yeah. hey, uh, are you interested in coming and being our pastor? Uh, oh, okay, yeah, sure. And, and you, you look, when I look back on that two years later, I'm like, wow, mm. the blessing of just going through that season far outweighs the, the horribleness of, of mm. the season. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I think when you, when you give that to people, then their, their perspective will change. Mm. You know, like look for the blessing now. Yeah. yeah. And that's why you went through it. Yeah, mm -hmm. of course, that's so difficult for some. You've yeah. got to yeah, take but, her eyes and, off ourselves, and yeah. it's, it's hard. Yeah. As pastors, I think we get it a little bit more than the average person. But for sure. the average person, I would, I, the ad average Christian, I would encourage them not to give a cliché in this yeah. situation. Oh, don't, yeah. wow. don't answer with a cliché. Yes. You know, sometimes encouraging someone, your hands are going to get dirty, your feet are going to walk through the mud, you're going to go through some things with those people to actually encourage them. And I think that's what we got to make sure we understand right. yeah. that cliches aren't going to do it. Right. Just no. some, oh, God's blessing you at this time and right. God's giving you great opportunity for joy. Scripture, absolutely. But we can't just do that past say. And I think as pastors, we get that. Mm -hmm. But I also, knowing, yeah. knowing who's watching the show, I want to make sure they understand right. that that can't just be a cliche right. answer. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it comes with the action. You know, faith and works... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Faith and works. Mm -hmm. Faith is salvation, but right. works comes with the following of Christ. And I yeah. think, you know, most Christians like pastors, we, we want to get out our little toolbox and fix something. <laughs> okay. And we do. And that's yeah. where cliches come yeah. from. That's where, you know, we use verbiage that, that some of the people hurting don't even understand. You know, to tell someone that just lost someone, well, God must need another angel in heaven. Oh, that makes oh, me Can I tell you that's so, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. but here's what I tell everybody. When you don't know what to say, shut up. Exactly. But show There's up. There's a great biblical example of this. It's Job's three friends. When they sit there <laughs> and say nothing for yeah. seven days or whatever it is. So, yeah, yeah, that's the best. Yeah. Yeah. When they started talking, everything went downhill. Yeah. There, there's this idea about ministry of presence, isn't yeah. it? Just, right. just yeah. being yeah. with just somebody. Be there. Just yeah. be there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people say, well, you know, as a pastor, you, you walk through the fire with someone and they say, how did you do that? The same way you should have. You show yeah. up. You're just yeah. there. Mm -hmm. what, what do you say? I don't say anything until they ask me. Because nothing I'm going to say is going to help. Yeah. I got nothing except to be the presence of Christ.
that they know Jesus is here with us mm -hmm. because they know I represent that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the Christians, we got to remember, we represent that for our friends and family. Just show up. I live in the Alanese community and they've had a lot of death with young people. And I'll never forget the first one I really walked through where I was more involved before I ever got to the house. And I was one of the first people they called. There were already three ladies in that kitchen, getting that kitchen ready uh, for food, yeah. for water, for fellowship. Mm. Because the greatest thing that will happen is when people show up, now we've got to feed them. So those ladies knew what to do. Nobody had to tell them. Nobody had to call them and say, hey, show up at the Richardson's house and, and provide food mm -hmm. and get things ready. They just did it. And I was like, man, and that's what the body of Christ is supposed yeah. to do? And as far as I knew, none of the ladies in the kitchen were Christians. So, but they knew what to do. So God help from, us. From, yeah. just mm -hmm. Continuing on with this thought, if, if someone that's, uh, that's dealing with suffering, this, this isn't so much an indication that God's mad at them, nope. right? I mean, sometimes no. we no. get this idea, don't mm -hmm. we? This bad thing happened to me, and so God's mad at me. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of my favorite uh, stories uh, in Scripture is in uh, is John chapter 9, uh, the man that Jesus healed that was born blind. Yeah. The disciples, start that whole chapter starts off with, the Who's disciples yeah. asked Jesus, whose fault is this? Whose fault is yeah. this? Yeah. Because, and that was the common thinking in, in, in first century Palestine. And, and it when, is in the when somebody was born blind, <laughs> exactly. Not a whole lot has changed. You know, that, that is sometimes the default. Well, gee, I must have loused something up, you know, for God to do this to me. That, that I think, is, is a tool from the enemy. It's the tool that he uses to get us to say, well, you know, gee, I, I, I must have messed up. I'm not good enough. Uh, now, otherwise, there are this wouldn't have happened. times I suffer when I have made a bad decision. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Stupid. Oh, yeah. Reap what you sow. But, <laughs> right. but there's plenty of times where it, it yeah. I have a good answer for this. Right. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like the disciples asked you, whose fault is this? And he's mm. saying, no, it's yeah. nobody's fault. Well, yeah. and, and Jesus' answer was even more astounding. Uh, it's anybody's fault. This man was, was born in this condition so that the power of God might be displayed. Yeah. yeah. And he yeah. goes on later to heal him. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, so, so we've got to, to drop that mindset that, that necessarily God's punishing me. Yeah. He is allowing things to happen. And I don't know about y'all, but sometimes I'm a little slow on the uptake. <laughs> sometimes I need that two by four. Uh, and sometimes God provides that, but not always. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, Jeff, I think the challenge for all of us, and, and, and I, I kind of almost chuckle on myself, we're trying to answer a question that a lot smarter people than me, at least, I won't include y'all yeah. in that, but I think of Chuck Swindoll, uh, Dr. James Dobson, they've all written books on, you know, well, yeah. where's God when bad things happen and, you know, all those things. And, and why does God let God bad things? It's an answer that's been asked. It's it, a question that's been asked a lot. The bottom line I think we can do is get people to Christ. Mm hmm in their suffering, in the good times, in the bad times. It's just, we, we just got to do our best to get people to the yeah. only source of hope that there is. Our presence is great, but man, we, it, it's got to represent Christ and it's got to help them get to that. Gentlemen, thank you for your response here today. It's been really good. I'm so glad you've spent a few minutes with us here as we try to tackle some of life's questions. I will encourage you, get yourself into this book on a regular basis. It'll change your life. My name is Jeff Milslegel. So glad to have you watching us today on Life's Questions. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We are able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.